Hi, Scott and Darrow from Banner Engineering. Retroreflective mode sensing offers a lot of advantages and flexibility when it relates to applications where you want to apply a photoelectric. Daryl, can we touch a little bit on where we might use retroreflective and some of the nuances and gotchas that go along with maybe applying a solution that uses a retroreflective photo eye? Sure, Scott. <clears throat> so with the retroreflective mode, we have three different types, standard, polarized, and coaxial. So I'll step through those with you. With the standard, again, retro has the emitter and receiver in one housing, and we have a separate reflector that sends light back to the receiver. Object comes in between those, switches the sensor's output. We use uh, red light, which is helpful sometimes because you can go out to 30 feet or further with retro, and it helps with alignment. We can also use infrared. Laser is becoming uh, very, very popular. And there's also uh, polarized and on-axis, and I'll get back to that later. But out of those three different types of retroreflective sensors, the standard has the longest range. Now, there's a got you with that, though. If you have an application that has a shiny object, let's just say you had a food, food plant and a shiny can is going down a conveyor line, that shiny can can mimic a reflector and send back a false trip. So to get around that, <clears throat> we can go to polarize. But before we do that, let's talk about the outputs on these. Again, just like a pose mode, we had light operate and dark operate. Just a quick recap. Light operate means the emitter is sending light to the receiver. If there's nothing blocking it, that sensor's output will operate. Dark operate is the opposite. If there is an object in between the emitter and the receiver, the output operates. It's typically the mode that most people use with retroreflective sensors. So, polarization. This is used to help uh, safeguard against false proxying. And the way we do that is we put a filter on the emitter and the receiver 90 degrees out of phase with each other. So let me give you an example. In this example, on the emitter, we have the uh, filter sending light out on the vertical plane. If it hits an object other than the, a reflector, let's just say a shiny can, the light will come back on that same plane. Well, on the receiver, we have a horizontal lens, so the light will not enter, therefore guarding against false proxying. When you do the same thing with the reflector, light goes out on the vertical plane, the reflector actually disorients the light, light that comes back on the horizontal plane enters the receiver, and we get detection. Now there's a drawback with this, because of the filters, you have less excess gain and thus less range, but no false proxying. And with all retroreflective sensors, you have a blind spot. The reason for that is, as the light leaves the emitter and hits the corner cube in a reflector, the corner cube tries to send it back on the same plane. However, it does fan out over time, but you, there has to be a little bit of a distance with the, uh, between the sensor and the reflector. That may be a disadvantage depending on the application. Another important part is effective beam. So in this case, the effective beam becomes now the size of the reflector. So if you have an application where you're trying to see a small object, let's just say a pin, it will not block the entire reflector. Therefore, the sensor may never ever see that pin. So to get around that, you have to go with a smaller reflector. But keep in mind, smaller reflector, smaller surface area, shorter range. Lastly is the coaxial. <clears throat> Up until this point, every sensor uh, every emitter had its own lens, likewise the receiver. With coaxial, they share the same lens using a beam splitter and filters. So the light hits the beam splitter, reflects to the reflector, comes back. Part of that beam splitter sends light to the receiver. What this does for us, it gives us a lot of advantages. We no longer have a blind spot, and with this technology, we can see a clear object. So wrapping it up, <clears throat> the pros, Again, retroreflective offers the second highest uh, mode of excess gain. You only have to power up one site. There's no blind spot if you use a coaxial sensor. This also gives you a very tight beam to see through small openings uh, or for precise uh, lead edge detection. And we can detect clear objects. Pretty much does it, Scott. Daryl, one of the, uh, what you had talked about for a reflector, you pretty much referred <clears throat> to 
a hard corner cube reflector right. like this guy here. Another option <coughs> in that area is reflective tape. It's very flexible, you can trim it, you can cut it down, peel off the back, stick it to a rail. So it's very flexible in that regard. Yeah. But what are some what are some examples of where you wouldn't want to use uh, reflective tape and maybe some of the drawbacks as a result of that? Yeah, great question because tape is very popular with a lot of customers, although it may not be advantageous because the main reason is with every reflector there are corner cubes and that's what sends light back to the, the sensor. With tape, there are different types of corner cubes. They're not as efficient as a hard case reflector. So you're going to lose a lot of range when you go to reflective tape. It could also be problematic when you're using a polarized sensor because the corner cubes in tape don't quite rotate the light the same way a hard case reflector does. Now, Banner does carry a special tape for that. You can call one of our apps engineers and they can help customers out with it. So while it's a very flexible option, sometimes this is a better, more reliable solution in those retroflective applications. While, uh, while tape may be reserved for more of those right. uh, clunk and bang style applications.